Chapter 6. Mealtime Music Patients who are confined to bed, or for that matter, to a hospital, find meals progressively monotonous in spite of the fact that there is a greater variety offered them than was theirs at home. This monotony results in part from the color and nature of the environment, the personnel, the general atmosphere of the hospital, and the constraining nature of institutional restriction. While dining at home, some of these factors are subconsciously dissipated by trivial, intimate conversation, friendly faces, individual attention, and the security of the things for which home stands. There are only a few things which can be done to make hospital meals more enjoyable, aside from those features best handled by the chef and menu planner. But it is possible to increase the pleasure of meal periods through the manipulation of certain environmental factors. One of these is the use of color and decor in hospital dining halls to simulate home surroundings. In the ward, this is most difficult where little can be done except by introducing attractive hangings which are less hospital-like or by the application of paint in cheerful colors. The latter method is sanitary and practical. Since ancient times, music has been used as an accompaniment to meals. The instruments used by the ancients for this purpose were usually those which emitted soft sounds. Voltaire said that our purpose in going to the opera was to promote digestion. During the preceding century, dinner music became stylized and consisted largely of semi-classical pieces or waltzes played softly in slow tempo by string ensembles. During the past 25 years, there has evolved a form of dinner music which is not only a marked departure from the old, but has come to be used as a source for dancing between and during courses. Whether the physiologic and psychologic effects of dancing during a meal are harmful, beneficial, or of no moment remains undecided. Certainly there seems to have been little interest in analyzing its effects. During the period when dinner dance music was available only in a few places, the number of those who could be affected by it was very small. But with the more recent installations of jukeboxes and other forms of mechanically reproduced music into all varieties of dining places, the problem is worthy of investigation. Most people derive pleasure from the consumption of appetizing food. Most people derive pleasure from music played to their taste. Although the logic of the following thought is subject to criticism, it does sound reasonable to state that two pleasurable experiences enjoyed simultaneously should add up to a greater happiness than that afforded by either individually. Food has received thorough study with respect to preservation, preparation, serving, and the time of day when each item is most satisfying. Some of the conclusions have been arbitrary, but for the most part, people eat the food that agrees with them physiologically and psychologically. There is no especial good reason why cereals should be eaten by adults only in the morning. It has become a matter of custom or advertising, and the minds of the masses have become conditioned to feel that cereal is especially good at breakfast time. A generation ago, the breakfast menu in some homes differed little from the present-day dinner fare. Eating habits have become set in the minds of most people, and there is little that can be done to change them rapidly. Daily routines have given rise to certain music conventions as well. Until recently, music at breakfast was uncommon. Bernard Shaw wrote, Quote, music after dinner is pleasant. Music before breakfast is so unpleasant as to be clearly unnatural. End quote. With the advent of radio, this has changed even if Shaw has not. Lunchrooms, barbershops, and other public places where people spend time inactively are equipped with mechanisms for reproducing music. The practice of reading or even studying schoolwork at home with the radio on has become increasingly prevalent. The tempo of living has stepped up to the point where most people, especially the younger, like to do two things at once, especially if one of these is to listen to music. The effect of different foods upon digestion and health is known, and most persons eat with a regularity which is related to capacity and needs. They are usually able to select the items they desire, the time at which they will eat, and the period for consumption. 
The ideal attitude while eating is one of mental serenity and physical repose. If certain criteria are observed, music can be relaxing. The elements which increase relaxation are melody, rhythm, and softness. If the music which accompanies meals is carefully selected, it can make eating more pleasurable, and this is desirable for patients in the hospital. Mealtime music must be unobtrusive. It must lack stimulating qualities which attract attention. If the diner can promptly name the selection played five minutes earlier, that piece was too impressive in score or performance. Perhaps the most suitable form of dinner music is that played by a small string ensemble. The piano and harp are also very satisfactory, alone or in combination with the ensemble. When the piano is played in the hesitant, legato style of Eddie Duchin, it is particularly desirable. The shrill sounds of the flute or the brassy sound of the trumpet must be omitted. The music must be soft and slow. Avoid vocals and strange instruments. The volume of the music should be maintained at as nearly the same level as is consistent with the source of the music. It should begin without fanfare or any attempt to attract attention. The level of intensity should not interfere with conversation, for if the loudness of the music demands an increased volume of voice to carry on a normal conversation, it defeats the purpose of relaxation by evoking increased energy on the part of the speaker. When possible, the end of the selection should fade out. There should be nothing abrupt about the selection, and unusual sequences or novelties should be avoided. The music should be fluent and entirely unexciting. The interval between pieces should be brief in order to sustain auditory reception at a fairly continuous level. Five to ten seconds between numbers is recommended, and this coincides approximately with the time required to change discs on an automatic or manually controlled record player. Musical selections should be played in groups. The groups should last a total of about 15 minutes, with rest intervals of about 3 minutes. This simulates the requirements and performance of the live ensemble and has become a part of stylized dinner music. The music should last as long as the meal. Ideally, the source of the music should not be obvious, and to this end, a concealed loudspeaker has an advantage over the live ensemble, which, through its motions or the physical appearance or mannerisms of its members, may distract diners. There should be no vocal announcements between selections. Occasionally, a listener will want to know the name of the song being played, because it is familiar, reminiscent, or sweet. When the budget will permit, printed or mimeographed programs are most welcome to those whose interest is aroused. The music recommended is the music which has been played by dinner ensembles for years. Their repertoires usually include waltzes by Strauss and his contemporaries, selections from operettas by Herbert, Frimmel, and Romberg, and the popular favorites of the past decade, such as selections from the musical comedies of Kern, Cole Porter, and Gershwin, or the songs of Carmichael and Berlin. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that mealtime music must be physiologically non-stimulating and noisy music is to be avoided. Douglas Gerald declared that he hated to dine amidst the strains of a military band. He said he could taste the brass in his soup. Hayden J. Music as Medicine, 1895, 9, 369. A foreman of a shop in which music was played during mealtime begged that raucous music be omitted to give the digestion a break. Some orchestra leaders habitually use arrangements which approximate the qualities desirable for mealtime music. Among these are Wayne King, Merrick Weber, Andre Castellanos, David Rose, Frankie Carl, Carmen Cavarello, Eddie Duchin, Guy Lombardo, and the following orchestras, Boston Pops, New Mayfair, Percy Faith, Anton and Paramount, Victor Salon, Victor Continental, Palmer House Ensemble, Selinsky String Ensemble. All these have been recorded, and a sample list of their recordings follows as a nucleus of a mealtime music library. Victor Recordings, Southern Roses, 26322B, Sweetheart Waltz, 
26322A. Black Eyes, 20037B. Our Waltz, 27853B. Holiday for Strings, 27853B. Fruling Strimmen, 4387A and B. Dream Waltz, V214. None But the Lonely Heart, 4413B. Song of the Islands, 27224B. La Golandrina, 27451B. Lover, Come Back to Me, 27397A. Indian Love Call, 27397B. La Secret, 20416A. Pirouette, 20416B. Wine, Women, and Song, 6647A. A Shepherd's Tale, 9479A. Narcissus, 9479B. Come Back to Sorrento, 27917A. Gavat from Mignon, 27917B. Zyguner, 24609B. Tales of Hoffman, 20011B. Badinage, 12591A. Air de Ballet, 12591B. Gold and Silver, 25199B. Blue Danube, 25199A. Columbia Recordings, Begin the Begin, 4265M. Easter Parade, 4292M. With a Song in My Heart, 4292M. The Touch of Your Hand, 4291M. Somebody Loves Me, 4291M. Falling in Love, 4266M. T for Two, 4266M. Josephine, 36692. Louise, 36692. Estragita, 4236M. London Again, 69264D. By the Tamarisk, 69264D. Swan Lake, 69357D. Rosalie, 36543. Speak to Me of Love, 35551. Pavane, 7361 M. Claire de Lune, 7361 M. Decca Recordings. The Very Thought of You, 3110B. Cocktails for Two, 3110A. Every Little Movement, 18300B. Minute Waltz, 18466A. Blue September, 15050A. Valse Bluet, 15049B. Sleepy Lagoon, 18286A. End of section 8.